Hey guys, welcome to Talking Metal. Very special guest tonight, Chris Aiken from The Classic Metal Show, also known for writing some great books that I've really enjoyed. The most recent one I read, which I think is probably two years old at this point, is called Call Me Chris. It's a tr- you know true story about the horrific accident that Chris suffered and his recovery. And of course, there's always uh, some connection to the the rock and, and metal world that goes on in his writing. Although primarily this book is about his recovery and it's uh it's it's definitely a powerful read. Highly recommended. It. It's linked through today's show notes on talkingmetal.com. Go there and just click on over to Amazon and pick up a copy. It is uh it is great stuff. And again, a very powerful read. So let's get into one of Chris's favorite bands. We're going to talk about this band, and he has a deep connection to Pantera uh, in a few different ways. This is Mouth for War, followed by my interview with Chris Aiken. Hey, guys. Would you please welcome to the Talking Metal Podcast, Chris Aiken from the Classic Metal Show. Chris, how are you? I am good, man. How are you? I'm great, man. I'm excited to talk to you. And after all these years, I think it's just great that you've agreed to to come on the show with me. You know, we've had a a feud in the past that at this point is a, a few years behind us. And I'm just I'm glad to have you here to talk some metal. I'm glad to be here, man. And as much as you and I have talked, you know, behind the scenes, I'm glad that that that, that nonsense is done, man, because it's it's good to get past it. It was I don't want to say it was fun while it lasted, but it made for some silly stuff. But, yeah, you know, um, you know, at the same time, it's good to move forward and it's good to be a little more grown up maybe than I personally was. So, right. you know, we'll take that as as is. Yeah, me too. And let's let's see what our listeners think. But you know, regardless of what they think, we're here talking on the <laughs> Talking Metal podcast. Exactly. So you've written some great books, and I've read three of them. I was I was thinking I read two of them, but then I realized I read the Metallica one too. So I want to talk about those books. But first, you know, I just wanted to get into a little bit of your your history on. CMS and and how that started because you guys are possibly one of the longest running if not the longest running like internet streaming podcasting hard rock heavy metal show out there and uh, you know you've been doing it a very long time so let's let's go back to the beginning where did you and Neely first meet um, well, I actually, Neely had another co-host, you know, he, he had a, he had the show in a little small station just north of Akron, Ohio. And he had another co-host who was a personal friend of mine and I had a music magazine and, um, his friend introduced us at a black crows concert actually. And, um, you know, wh- while we were, we were chit chatting, you know, it was one of those things where he threw out the blanket offer that everybody does like, Hey, if you ever want to come on and promote your magazine, come on, you know, come on down. So I did one time in, wow, it had to be like 2000. Wow. In, and, um, now this came, was an actual radio show or was it internet radio at that point? No, that, at that point it was an actual radio show. Okay. And, um, and so I came on the show and we, and I kind of pushed his co-hosts out of the way and him and I had some immediate chemistry because at that point it was just a, it was really just a music show. And then he would come out of breaks and say, Hey, that was Jackal. And here's a band I like it's Y and T. And you know, yeah. it was just that kind of a show. But then I started coming down to promote my magazine. And before long we were doing little bits and I was doing impressions and you know, we were interviewing guys and you know, it just kind of turned into something. So Fast forward a couple of years, I ended up doing his website for him. And one of the things that we did, and this is how long ago this was, was put his, the entire six hour show up on the web every, every week. And the way we would do it is he would, he would swing by my house after doing the show at 3 AM and he would put cassettes, wow. in my mailbox. And then I would have to take the cassettes and I would have to play all six hours into my computer on a Sunday and rip them to real audio 
<laughs> that's, wow. And that's how we, we started being on the internet though, was because I was putting the show up all six hours on, on his website and, you know, we were actually streaming and this was 2000, 2001. I mean, it was wow. at the very beginning of streaming. So we did that for a few years and then he had a job opportunity, which took him to Chicago. And when, when he did that, then he was doing the show with like live 365. You know, on Saturdays for like 12 people or 20 people or whatever it was. But the technology got better and I'm a tech. You know, I mean, in in my real life, one of the things I do is I own an IT business, so I am tech savvy. And as we got moving forward, Skype got better and better and we got to where we could sort of do the show co-hosting in, in like 2000 and I attempt to say 2005, I joined the show full time. And we were off and running, and and it's just kind of kind of gone like that since. And in two thousand five, that's about the same time you started technically podcasting the show too, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we were we were very 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 early. I, I remember the first time I put up iTunes. That was back when you could actually call somebody at iTunes. Yeah. Yeah, you because know, the tech was so confusing. And I remember talking to the guy for hours on how to write all the code for posting a podcast. And when, when the podcast actually started, there were 13 total podcasts on iTunes. And we were one of them. We were at the, we were at the very, very beginning. Now that might not have been all across the board, but that was just like music podcast. There was 13. Wow. And we were one all the way back in that might even have been 2004 because that might have been before I actually came on. So right, right, it was yeah. crazy. Yeah, that's. I mean, and when you look at where podcasting just is now, I feel like it wasn't really until like four, maybe five years ago that it just really started to explode. And you know, now everyone has a podcast, listens sure. to a podcast, and. And I mean, but this technology has been been around for a while. How how did you first discover the the podcasting technology? Um, well, I'm a dork, and uh, you know, I I anything I see, I try. And I I just remember reading about it. Um, uh, what's his name? Adam Curry is he yeah, the one? Yeah. I uh, you know, I read something about about it, and and I was also in addition to doing the classic metal show, I had my show, the metal show on um, FM on, on FMs, right. and we we were trying to do it there as well. You know, we were we were trying to podcast some of our interviews and stuff there. So it was just kind of, you know, saw it and wanted to be ahead of the curve and wanted to try something unique and cool and you know, lucked into something that actually hit, you know? So I, I, I mean, I think I just read an article, you know, in like variety or something and was like, Oh, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. But you know, podcasting to me, especially now, I, I, I can't talk highly enough about it. It's, it's, it's the game changer. It has really eliminated all of the, all of the BS of, you know, of corporate radio. You yeah. can't hide behind the fact that you have a contract anymore because somebody that, somebody that's not afraid to swear and somebody that's not afraid to have a hard opinion and isn't necessarily trying to make money can steamroll right by you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not that our show is huge or small or whatever it is, what it is, but you know, we get a lot of audience that it, we're, we're taking a lot of audience from a lot of FM stations that, you know, where people don't want to hear the Waka Waka radio anymore. And, right, and right. you guys have been doing that for a while too. And it's the same thing. It's, you know, it's it's a very different medium, but it's a medium where regular people can be regular people. And more and more, I think that's what people want. They don't want to hear, hey, it's three after the hour and right after the sports, we're going to get to traffic. And then your favorite song by Jackal. Right. No, one, no one wants to hear that anymore. Yeah, no, totally. Now, you mentioned the audience. The, and let's talk about the CMS audience, because from from where i stand uh, it, uh, it seems as though you you guys have a strong devoted loyal very loyal audience uh, uh, more so than some other podcasts in my opinion what what has how has that loyalty uh become you know uh, what what creates that loyalty i guess is what i'm trying to ask um 
I think a lot of honesty. You know, I, I think people people definitely know, especially with me more than Neely, but they know that if I say it, I damn well mean it. And they know that if I could, if I say it to a, to the microphone, I would say it to somebody's face. And, you know, that's rare in, in broadcasting in general. I mean, you see it as well as I do. All these celebrities are phony yeah. and not that I'm a celebrity, I'm far from it, but you know, I, I tend to say what I think when I think, and I, I don't care what the consequences are. So I, I think that might have been the start of it. Um, certainly, they liked um, a certain feud that used to happen. Right, right. <laughs> you know, they they definitely liked that, and they definitely liked other feuds that we had as well. But um, I think in in 2012, you know, I took a little break from the show, trying unsuccessfully to save my marriage. But when I came back, when I came back to the show. You know, I, I sort of had a different attitude. And one of the things that I wanted to do with the show coming back was to share my, my real life because my real life is stupid, ridiculous. You know, day to day, I do more stupid things that most people can't believe, whether it's the good <laughs> or bad or whatever. Yeah. You know, and, and I told Neely when I came back, I said, I can't talk about, you know, who the new singer of Queensryche is anymore. You know, I, I got to talk about my life and what I'm doing. And I think people will be interested in that. And we did that and we've done that. And I've told all my crazy dating stories as I became newly single. And that was pretty funny and wild. And, you know, right. again, it was honest. But, you know, the audience exploded. It absolutely exploded. We went from, you know, in, in the heyday up to like 2009, we were doing maybe, maybe 10,000 downloads a week on with the podcast. Now we're doing 30,000 and we're doing 3000 live listeners on a Saturday. And that's awesome. I, I, and, and our YouTube channel is about to crack a million and our, our podcast is about to crack 3 million downloads. And you know, it's ridiculous how it's grown. And you know, you, you mentioned it and I'll, I'll celebrate our fans to death. They're, they're, it, they're loyal to the point of scary sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even to me, you know, some of the porn that hits our chat room is outright. <laughs> it makes me turn the chat room off and right. I'm not very wow. well. Offended. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it, it's one of those things that they are loyal and I do spend a lot of time interacting on online with, with our fans. And I, and I mean, not just a, Hey, thanks for listening, but you know, if our fans interact with me, if they throw me a message, uh, I'll talk to them for hours. I, right, I don't cool. care because it's, I, I'm a regular dude and I don't care how big the show gets or whatever. I'm never going to not be a regular dude. I'm a guy that hopefully everybody wants to have a beer or six with and Absolutely. just, and just, you know, and it has grown us an audience. Yeah. Now, you know, kind of to circle back around to Neely, it, you know, I, I love, Penn Jillette. I listen to his podcast and, and always been sure. a big fan of his and love the magic that, that, uh, that Penn and Teller do. And one thing I was surprised to find out when I read Penn's book was that he and Teller, they're friends, but they're not, everyone thinks they're best friends and they go everywhere together and they hang out together. And I guess I started to wonder just how much, uh, you know, other couples that I see or hear on the radio are how tight they are in real life. Um, and how close are you and Neely in real life? Are you like super good friends or best friends? Like, like, cause I almost got from the book, the books that I read about you, that you definitely have other friends that are probably closer to you than Neely. Sure. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I, I mean, I, I definitely have you know, I have a I have a core group of people. It's ten people, and it's called the core nine because I'm too lazy to change it. But, right. <laughs> um, um, but and Neely's in there, but you know, he, he doesn't live here, right. so that does that does put some some distance in there. But you know, I mean, him and I we talk all the time. You know, we we probably talk. In fact, really, about the only day that I can guarantee you we don't talk is on Saturdays because. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we do not, it's one of the weird things about the show is we do not share topics at all. You know, we, really? we, we, we both believe that the show is better when it's organic and the reaction is real. And it's not one of those things where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to bring up this story about whatever. 
and you know he and he likes to he knows what pushes my buttons and a lot of times he'll bring stories like that to the table just to hear me start ranting and raving and yelling and hollering and and that's okay because that's kind of the show that we do so but to answer your question i mean we're we're definitely tight i mean i do in addition to doing the show with Neely, I actually do business with his company. That oh, do you? okay, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I've built several websites for Neely with outside interests, and I've done web work for many of his his companies and his friends, and you know, and so we we definitely we're definitely more than just hey, we do the show and then we're gone. You know, we we're I would say he's one of my better friends, definitely. Very cool. Now you mentioned the the period where you left the show, mm-hmm. uh, which I guess was what like two years or even two more than more than that. Two, 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 it was from from January of two thousand nine to um, uh, about August of two thousand twelve. Right. So we know that you left the show because there were, were issues with your marriage, and you, yeah. know, you had to do that. And that's kind of been well documented. You've I sure. guess, written about it in the book. You've you've spoken about it on on CMS. But one thing I always wondered is what happened to the show while you were gone, because honestly, it disappeared off my radar one hundred percent during that time. I believe the podcast stopped. I didn't even did. know if the show was still going on during that time. And, and I think when I was at M3, Neely told me it was, right? Yeah, it was. It, it, you know, it was a weird time. And, you know, like, like you said, it would, I, I had to leave. It was, it was last-ditch effort to save a failing marriage, and it didn't work. Right. And, but whatever. That's, you know, neither here nor there. Um, but during that time, he continued on. He did his six hours a week. But it, it clearly wasn't the same. It was definitely back to play in music, and you know he would take calls and read really long emails from from listeners and whatever, and and that was the extent of it. And no podcasts, and no podcasts, no nothing. But it, you know, and, and what's funny is, you know, I was on the sidelines. I didn't want to see it die because I had helped build it. Yeah, and you know, but it was that: do I fight with my wife and go back on, or do I? you know, try and save, you know, half my money. So, (laughs) so that was, that was the decision I was left with. So I I had to make the smarter decision during that time though. I tried frantically to get him to take on another co-host. I actually, I actually had him trying out different people. I recommended people. I vetted people trying to get him another co-host and he just wasn't feeling it. He, he, me in 2009 and he told me the day that I came back that he knew I would come back. So he didn't want to fill the slot because he just wanted to wait until I came back. And you know what? That proved to be pretty prophetic when you, when you look at it now, but it almost killed the show. I mean, the show was like, like I said, it was, it was, I think the, the best numbers we saw were about 800 listeners in a week. Yeah. Not right. that that's horrible. I mean, right. I know a lot of shows that would like that, but that those eight, less. Yeah. Yeah, and less. those eight were down from ten thousand, and those eight hundred were probably just like you know, like legacy listeners that that was just what they were used to doing. Right, right, and and you know, it it, it was a dark period, but it came, but it came back, and I'm amazed that the show has grown, has not only come back but grown, and you know, I, I'm happy that it has. Yeah, absolutely. And congratulations. It sounds like you're getting just great numbers now. And we'll, we'll kind of segue off a a CMS uh, in a minute, but I, you know, to kind of go into our feud, you know, this, this went on for years and years and, and it was when you came back to the show, uh, Mm -hmm. when it was that 2012. Yeah, it was in 12. Yeah. When I, so you guys started up with the you know uh, the talking metal critiques again, sure. although it was it was less. I don't feel like you were doing it as much as you had done in sure. the years past. I I listened to a lot of them, not all of them, but the one thing that I started to notice, and I may be wrong, and you can correct me about this, is mm-hmm. when I'd listen to you doing these critiques after the long break, I started to get the sense that. 
some of them, you were kind of just going through the motions. Uh, and, and I didn't feel the sincerity that the attacks had previous to your break. And again, this is just my opinion, but no, you- I, I remember listening to one one day. I remember exactly where I was. I was uh, like on a lunch break at work and I was like, specifically you, since you were kind of leading the attack, but I felt like, well, Neely is kind of like pushing him along on this and it doesn't even really sound like he's doing that, doing this from his heart. And that was when I decided to write you the first email because sure. I kind of felt like uh, enough is enough. And, and I, I, I the, you know, it's time I, we at least talk. And I was getting this sense that you were almost doing it for the fans at that point. I mean, am, am I on uh, any Here, truth to this? No, there's a hundred percent truth to that. I, um, I, I went through a whole thing and, and you read it in the books, you know, you you read it in victories yeah, where victories. I really tried to change myself, you know, and I just didn't want to, I spent so much time prior to my divorce, just being a hateful raging fucking asshole, <laughs> just to be blunt about it. Right. And, and, and I didn't want to do that anymore. I just didn't want to do it. And when we came back, I didn't have the the same energy. You know, I mean, a part of it, there was a part of it that was, you know, at the time the feud started. Yeah, I was very mad. Right. You know, I, I was I was very mad. And the fire that I was spitting was very real. It was yeah. it was real good that we had a thousand miles between us. <laughs> yeah, it was really good that that was the way it was, where the worst place we could fight with each other was on the microphones. Right. on. But. When I came back, you know, and I, and I even, I think I wrote about, I don't remember, but I think I wrote about a little bit about the Talking Metal feud and, and the, the Dirt Talk feud as well in Victories. Little Victories, yeah. Brief, yeah. brief, but I, yeah, I, I it was it, yeah. It was brief, but it was, but even that, you know, I'm going through a divorce and in my head, that kind of stuff was still in my head of, you know, I couldn't justify it to myself anymore. Right. So... So we, um, you know, when, when, when I came back to it, to the show, I, I, the listeners were immediately like, you know, we did a couple bits and they were funny and they were different, but immediately it was like, I, I start getting emails about, you got to hear talking metal 326 where Mark says this, or John says this. And I was like, you know what? Okay. Let's see if that's still there. And we did a few of them and it just wasn't. And me and, and Neely and I both, we had a conversation after, I don't think we only did, I think we only did like two or three, maybe at the most. Uh, and, possibly. Yeah. I don't know. And, and it just wasn't, we both agreed. It just was what that was at the time. Wasn't where my head was now. And my head was in a different place. And, um, so, it, and, 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 I just don't need that in my world anymore. You know, I don't need wars and I don't need feuds and I'm trying my damnedest not to be angry anymore or not as angry or whatever, but it, you know, it, it made sense to, to let it go. And almost like clockwork, that's when you hit me up and and it was like, wow. Okay. This is, this is different. This is something I never saw in a million years coming. And and to be, you know, so that the listeners know, it wasn't like we were all backslap. Okay, buddy, now let's let's be buddies type of a thing either. You and I had right. some heat, heated back and forth. Yeah, definitely. You know, in, in, in the emails, and but we worked we worked through it, and I think we both came to the compromise, or I don't even know it's a compromise. It's just the way that it is. That it that it was stupid to carry on something from what eleven years earlier or whatever right. it was. And I didn't want to do it. And you know what? I, and I've said it on the show. I'll say it right to you. Talk about tremendous balls to come into the into the lion's den of the CMS. Right. Well, and, you know, I, I know that could not have been comfortable. And I know you had to be like, how long before these two assholes turn on me and make right. me look like a dick? Yeah. And, you know, and it just it just worked out. I guess the way it was supposed to be. And, and I'm good with where we are now. I'm very good with it. Yeah, me too. And you know, it was, it was interesting actually meeting Neely in, in the physical sense at, at three, uh, you know, it was fun. I, when John was 
talking to you on the phone, I was talking to Neely the whole time and, and it was, uh, really cool to shake his hand. And he was so cool to us, by the way. I mean, he did stuff he didn't have to do. He was, he, you know, here, here's a guy we fought with for years. We shake his hand. He's like, Oh yeah. How are you guys? He's like, come meet Don Dockin, you know, and takes us right backstage to meet Don and get pictures with Don. <laughs> Hell of a nice guy. And I really uh, appreciate him taking us in to meet Don and, and just spending some time with us at M3. So that was yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, when, when Neely put John on the phone, you know, I, I was extremely drunk. And with, with that being being said, you know, it, it was uh, the, the segment re- went really well. And I was really happy that, that we were able to finally do that. But I cannot tell you the hate that I took immediately. I wow. mean, two seconds after we hung up, it was... It was, why don't you cup his balls, Chris? And, right. you know, 15, 15 messages on the, on the Facebook and Twitter and the, and the chat room went crazy. And, you know, but, but you know what, that, that's okay. Because that's kind of the, that's kind of the backlash that I built up by, by carrying a, a 10 year feud that should have been solved in five minutes with one phone call. Right. right. You know, but, but that you know that's kind of the the lesson you learn is you know you you take a beating when you when you build yourself up to be one way and you change yeah cool well i'm glad i'm glad we're at this point and dude i'd le- definitely like to come to the pinball museum get a tour by you and then we got to grab a beer sometime is that is that a possibility Absolutely, dude. Any anytime you want to come out that way, I know it's a little drive for you, but you know, you let me know when, and I'll make the drive from here as well, and we'll we'll you know we'll go do it. And we'll, there's a place to get lots of beer right next door, so absolutely. Tell tell me about the the pinball museum, where it is, and what it's all about. Sure. Well, the name of the place is uh, Pinball PA. It's a um, it's located in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, which is about eh, maybe 20 minutes uh, south of Pittsburgh. Um, we've got 410 odd games on the floor. There's 200 and whatever pinball machines and 200 something, um, you know, vintage arcade games. It's all the vintage stuff. It's, I mean, there's a few things that are from the two thousands, but almost everything is the eighties and nineties and seventies and all the way back to the forties. We have a couple machines, um, a lot of rare stuff, a lot of cool stuff. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's what you'd expect. It's, you know, we do birthday parties and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, but, but I mean, it, it's, it's about, it's about going in and playing those video games that you remember, whether it's asteroids or space invaders or joust or kicks or what, you know, whatever the games are, you know, we, we, there's a really good chance that we have them there. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a big venture. It's a, it was a big venture for me and Certainly at the, at a time when I already had one business going and I'm in the middle of writing books and everything and right. might have been ambitious to do that, but I'm not scared of that. <laughs> right on. And, you know, let's, let's talk about the books too, because I read little victories and thought it was a great read. The Metallica one, what, what is the official name of the Metallica one? Uh, just ca- cause and effect Metallica. Right. Which is also a great read, but the the most recent one I read, which was a while ago at this point, but um, was the Call Me Chris. And for as much listening as I have done to CMS, I never really fully understood the seriousness of this this accident that you had sure. that you go into in in all its gory <laughs> details in 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 Call Me Chris. I mean, this was a uh, accident where you almost lost your life uh, sure. just very intense and it's it's a it's a great read it's call me chris by chris aiken it's sometimes uncomfortable but it's it's uh I, you know also there's something about it that's uh rewarding as you read it because you you see you you see chris take this journey after having this this terrible accident and where's the best place people can pick this book up? Always Amazon. I mean, Amazon is, is an easy way to get it. Um, I sell them on, I've got a website for, for my books, which is chrisakenbooks.com. 
Um, e- either place is good. You know, I, I mean, they're, they're anywhere that, that sells books really like Barnes and Noble has it and Barnes and Noble's website has it. And cool. it's pretty much anywhere. And it's, it's done really well, which is, you know, <laughs> surprising me that, that a, a book about being burned up would, would sell thousands of copies, but it has, and it's, you know, it's, it's very rewarding, I guess. And is it therapy for you when you write these, these books? Um, you know what? There, there, there are different reasons, really. I, I don't know. It, I wouldn't call call me Chris therapy because, man, it was tough to put my brain back into that mode. Yeah, but you some know? of that, some of the book was written many years earlier, right? And then you kind of finished. Sure. Well, the whole thing was written twenty whatever years ago. It was form. It was for a form of hand therapy. I, you know, the doctors gave me a tennis ball and were like, "Here, squeeze this ball to try and make my fingers work again." Right. And I did that for like three seconds and threw the ball away. I was like, you know, I ain't doing that. So they, they wanted me to type. So I started pecking and typing, you know, to, to try and get my fingers to work again. And that's how this thing got written originally was I was just writing about my day to day stuff and thoughts and whatever. But somewhere along the way, I lost the manuscript. And when I started the pinball business, my friend Ed, who's, who was, uh, he's my curator at the, at the museum. He, he said to me, he's like, dude, I have a copy of your manuscript. Wow. And I was like, really? So he, he gave it to me and I, and I looked through it and it was after little victories came out and I was like, wow, this really sucks. <laughs> you know? It was right. like, it, the writing was so bad by comparison to where I've gotten now. So I, I rewrote a good amount of it. But I, what I did was I, I read each chapter and I rewrote, like, I pretty much rewrote the whole book, but then I kind of compared chapters to see where the raw emotion felt better than me being, I don't know, retrospective looking at it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and basically what it turned into is the early chapters, the first six, seven, eight chapters are, are old writing, but then everything after that where I started evaluating, you know, how I was feeling and how I was treating people and everything else. That was definitely more that I wrote in 2000 and I guess it would have been 14. You know, I, I, I wrote all that stuff in 14. Now in the book, you detail this, this trip to a Pantera concert where you're, you're in the hospital and probably really in no shape to be venturing outside of the hospital, yeah. but you go to see Pantera live. And can, can you fill yeah. the listeners in a little bit uh, on what actually happens with this story and, and uh, tell us about leaving the hospital oh. to see this band? Sure. No, I love this story. This is my favorite story in the whole book. Yeah. It's a great, uh, one. my, my friend Scotty came up to the hospital and he was, he, he comes to visit me and, and this is in like January and th- the doctors are all telling me at the time, I'm not going to leave the hospital till August. But Scotty comes up and he's like, dude, you're going to be mad, you know, but I got to tell you something. I was like, okay, you know, I'm thinking it's work stuff or they're suing me or, right. you know, what with the, with the legal nonsense. And he's like, dude, Pantera's coming in April. And without even hesitating. Now, meanwhile, I'm, I'm laid up in a hospital bed, tied Jesus on the cross style because they've been doing surgery all over me. Right. You know, can't move, can't, can't stand, haven't stood up in weeks. And I'm, and I looked right at my friend Scotty and I was like, dude, go get me some tickets. And he's like, dude, you're not going to go. You're not, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to go, but I'll get you a t-shirt or something. And I was like, no, no, no. I was like, go get me some tickets. And and he kept him on. And finally I just got nasty. I was like, God damn it. Go get me some fucking tickets. You know, I, I like yelled at him. All the alarms in the room start going off the <laughs> running in them thinking I'm stroking out or something. Right. And, and he's like, okay, okay, okay. I'll go get you some tickets. So two days later, he shows up with a pair of tickets and I had one of those little cork boards in front of my, in front of my bed. And I had him take all the get well soon cards off it. And I had him put those two tickets on the board and take a marker and just put circles around that, around the tickets. So nobody would put anything over the tickets. Right. And I used those tickets Every time I wanted to quit doing something, every time they were killing me with rehab or killing me trying to work my fingers or, or whatever, you know, I was like, I'd look at those tickets and I was like, nope, give me some more. 
You know, if right. I felt like passing out, I would, you know, which happened a lot, I would be on the verge of passing out. And the last thing I would see is those tickets as I was passing out. And the last thing I would say to those nurses was keep doing the stuff if I pass out because I, I was not going to quit. So fast forward a couple months, I worked and lied and cheated my way into going home. I, I, I went home in whatever the, whatever the, the Monday after the Super Bowl was in 1995. Mm -hmm. So it's way early. I was supposed to be there till August. I went home like February 5th or whatever the date was. And the Pantera show was like April, whatever. And I was, I mean, I was, I should not have been home. I, I just, I couldn't function. I couldn't, I couldn't get up to go to the bathroom or, or get a, get a, a cup of milk or what, you know, I couldn't do anything. Right. I was literally just, I became my wife's patient instead of the doctor's or the nurse's patient. But come time for that Pantera show. I absolutely went. And, and I mean, my two buddies had to go with me and they kind of, they you were sat in a wheelchair. Me. No, no, I, I re you walked in. No. I walked in. I refused to sit, sit in a wheelchair. The, the wheelchair, this is so stupid. The wheelchairs had a little tag by the company that made them, which is Invacare. Right. And I was like, I'm not an invalid. I'm not sitting in the chair. Right. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't sit in the chair. I mean, it would take them hours sometimes to get me from appointment to appointment in the hospital. Yeah. Because I wouldn't sit in the chair. I'd walk 10 feet, lean on a wall, walk 10 more feet, lean on a wall. But I was not going to sit in those chairs. Wow. It's just my, my stubborn idiot attitude, I guess. But I went to this Pantera show and my, my two buddies who, uh, you know, I love them to death. My friend Scotty and, and Andy, two big boys, they, they got me into the show. They, we sat in the furthest that we could possibly sit at the top row of these bleachers at uh, the venue, which is Rhodes Arena, which is like a, it, it's, it's like a basketball court basically for Akron, for Akron University. Okay. And I sat at the top bleacher against the wall and these two guys positioned themselves around me so nobody could bump into me. And I sat in these bleachers and I was pouring blood everywhere through my shirt, God. through my pants, through everything because I was still ripped up. Yeah. But I went and in my mind, that was, that was, you know, that was what I wanted to do, which was to get back to being normal. And, and it was normal. And, you know, the nice byproduct out of it was that I, I ended up becoming really good friends with the Pantera guys, you know, a little later in life. And I still am, you know, one, one of my proudest moments recently was that Anselmo read my book. Wow. That's awesome. And, you know, I was talking to him, he's doing that Bill and Phil that with, um, Bill Mosley, right. That, that record. And I, I talked to him and I was like, dude, did you read the chapter? And he was like, Oh my God, dude, that was you. I, I didn't even realize it was you. And nice. you know, it's awesome. It's amazing. Awesome. And you know, it, it's, it's been a really cool ride. Pantera has been my favorite band w was my favorite band before that. And to actually have something of substance good come out of this accident where you know, I got to be friends and I got to do many, many cool things with my favorite band on the, on the planet well, is, you know, I, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but I wouldn't trade what I got from it either. It, it's funny. I'm right. looking right up in my office here. I literally have the t-shirt that I bought at that show nailed up to my wall and it oh, will never, awesome. it'll never come down and it looks tacky as shit and I don't care because you know, I look at that every day now when I want to quit when business or whatever is being being shitty, and I look at that and I'm like, yeah, I can beat just about anything. Wow! And you got to know not only Phil but the other guys in the band, and sure. of course Dimebag. And you know, there was I guess it was that tragic day, two thousand four, right, where <laughs> we we lost Dimebag. And I, I always think it's it's just incredible that you were literally one of the last guys to talk to him. I mean, the last yeah. interview Dimebag Daryl ever did in, in Ohio that, that tragic day was, was with you. Can, can you go back and think about that day? Where, where did the interview take place? Yeah, the, that interview was, um, I don't know that it wasn't that day, but it was, it was it like, right, okay. It was right then. It was right in that I know it wasn't that day because they were on an off day. Okay. And, and they were, 
they were, um, we had worked it out uh, again because I, I, I knew them a little bit and I knew the publicity people. This is damage plan we're talking about. Yeah, it was damage plan. And I had, um, you know, between myself and my partner on the metal show, Matt, we, we knew all the players to make this happen. And we just, um, you know, we, we, our friend, Billy Morris, who's been in warrant and tough and you know, all those bands, he had a, he had a really nice studio and we just asked him if we could set up and do it in the studio. So it would be really clean recording and, and a really good thing. So we did it at his studio and we had those guys in and they sat on stools and I sat on a big old speaker <laughs> in front of them. And even though I personally am friends with those guys, and I think you've heard this interview. I have. Yeah. I, I didn't pull any punches. You know, I, I went at them. Yeah. Because that was at the time when Philip was saying all his stuff and they were saying all their stuff. And, and I had just interviewed Phil like two weeks prior and I wasn't going to just let it all slide. And I didn't. And we had a tough interview, but a, but a good interview. And, and (laughs) one of the funniest stories that I have from that was, so we do the interview and um, at the end of it, you know, we, we did IDs and whatever. And then, right. and then Vin, Vin and dime kind of corner me and they were like, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I was like, what? And they were like, dude, really? Do you, do we need all that? And I was like, come on, you, what am I supposed to ask you guys? And Vince was like, yeah, yeah, I get it. You know, whatever. But, uh, dime was not hearing it. And dime was like, dime was like, you stay right here, brother. You stay right here. I was like, okay. So he walks across the studio to, uh, to the other end of the studio where there's a bunch of gear piled up. Yeah. He drags over this big amp, you know, that's, that's about as big as the amp that I was sitting on. It was a big amp. You know, I don't don't know shit about gear, but it was a big (laughs) big enough amp to, to sit or stand on. And he climbs up on top of the, of the, the amp. And he goes, we're going to, we're going to battle this out. Karate kid style. (laughs) <laughs> and, and you know i'm i'm a big dude man i'm a three 350 guy and he's like yeah yeah get up here get up here and i and i climbed up on the speaker and he gets into the karate kid pose <laughs> and i said to him i said i said dime i'm telling you now if we're gonna do this i am gonna kick you and he's like bring it on brother bring it on and i was like okay and i get up in the karate kid pose and, and, you know, there's a bunch of people gather around. And it's like three, two, one, boom. And we both kicked each other right square in the chest. Wow. And we <laughs> fell off the stairs. And, of course, everybody made sure Dimebag was okay. And I just laid on the floor. You know? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no at all. But, you know, and, and, and then we got up and, you know, hugged it out and laughed it off. And, yeah. and it, it was good. But, you know. That's the kind of cat that guy was. I, I, you know, I know I don't have to tell anybody that Dimebag was awesome. But my experiences with Dimebag were nothing but awesome. I miss that guy all the time. I hate December eighth. It is yeah. a it, it's a it's a day that makes me tremendously sad. Not only because we lost a great musician, but I personally lost a friend, and yeah. I hate that it happened in my state. You know, I I, I know yeah. that shouldn't matter. I you know I don't think it it would be any better if it happened in Arkansas or somewhere. But it's pretty tough knowing that you know it happened in a venue that I've been in a hundred times. Right. Right. Had you, know, had you been, had you been planning to go to the, to show, to the show? You know what? It, it was far enough away that I wasn't, you know, yeah, I, okay. I mean, it was El, El Rosa Villa's like two, two and a half hours from oh, wow. me. Okay. And, and it was, you know, it was during a week. So that wasn't happening right. for me personally. But, um, you know, and, and to be honest, I didn't like the damage plan record that much, you know, no, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, there's like two songs that I like on that record and the rest of it's kind of like, eh, whatever. But, you know, I, but I was friendly with those guys. I, you know, I, I'm still friendly with, with Phil Vinny. You know, I, I've talked to Vin a few times since, but I mean, you, you've run into Vince. He's very protected now about everything he does. And yeah, I mean, we've, uh, I've interviewed him, I think, three times maybe two two or three times since you know I, I i've only interviewed him two two or three times but uh it's been since you know december 
eighth, two thousand four, and I've always every time the publicist has been you can't ask him about this, you can't ask him about that, you know, all the stuff you want to ask him sure. about. So, sure. which you know, I've tried to be respectful of that, but sure, yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to just say, well, I was asked not to ask you about watching your brother get gunned down, but let's talk right. about let's, it anyway. Yeah. You know, you know, that's kind of a dick move. <laughs> yeah. Well, even even don't ask him about Phil. Don't ask, you know, don't yeah. ask him about Pantera. I remember the one time they were like, I, I said, I can't even ask any questions about the band Pantera. They were like, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would have passed on that one. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I mean, Phil, Phil to me is probably the most misunderstood guy of the bunch because if if you get to know Phil, Phil is like beyond awesome. He is he's definitely he'll take the shirt off his back if you're cold guy. Yeah. But he's just you know, he also again, maybe in Chris Aiken fashion, he says a lot of stupid shit sometimes and you know and mm-hmm. and has to answer for it and you know yeah. But but I, I mean I have nothing but but good things to say about Phil. The only guy I never really got along with was Rex in the band, and just I don't know I had bad run-ins with him, and he was kind of a dick at several things that we did. But but even with that, I you know it's it's you know you've been around enough bands to know there's one of those in every band. Yeah yeah. I, I mean sure. Rex too in his book. I don't know if you read his book, but he he goes I, off on he he just hates doing interviews. He hates anybody in in radio or press. I mean he has a, a thing in his book where he just like basically throws anybody who is you know interested in interviewing over the you know over the side you know. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Yep, it is. But overall, you know, I I do have good me personally. I have great history with Pantera. I have nothing but love and respect for those guys, you know, um, you know, and I hope they all do well. And I wish, you know, I'm one of those guys that actually does not want the reunion. I just think that without that, there's no reason. I mean, hell, Zach gave me a guitar to give my son when he was born. I I mean, I'm I, I love Zach, but. But I, I wouldn't. I, I personally would not want to go to see a show with Rex and Phil and Vince and Zach trying to mimic Dime. Yeah. It, 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 to me, that to me, that's disrespectful. To me, the band died when Dime did, and and I think it should be left there. No, I hear you definitely. And and why tarnish that legacy with something that you know? No matter how good the players are on stage it's just never going to live up to what they were you know and, and dime as, as great as dime was as a player what made dime was his energy you know i Absolutely. i mean if, if anybody that ever saw pantera shows yeah the playing was awesome but equally awesome was when he would be running around the stage spraying people with shaving cream you know while they're trying to do their drum solo or whatever yeah. you know i mean he brought such an energy that dude, and and you know, I talk about this one time all the time. I was I, they Pantera. It was Pantera, Anthrax, and Sebastian Bach were playing a gig at um in Akron. Okay, and okay. Phil had Phil had actually hooked me up, and and we were backstage partying our asses off at like three o'clock in the afternoon. And I don't even know why they were there, but they were all it, they were all there. So it was Phil, Dime. Um, uh, Scott Ian, uh, J- John Bush, Sebastian, and like all the road crew, right? We're just and, and we were getting blasted. I mean, just just drinking tons of of booze, and and everybody's telling story. And you know, I was in heaven. I got all my favorite rock guys around me, and I'm just hearing stories about you know stuff they'll never tell in the press, and that I'm not allowed That's to awesome. even tell. You know, but uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm getting hammered. And then it's like Sebastian has to go on and Sebastian goes out there and he's just ripped and he played a terrible show. Just, yeah. just, he's all slow and slow and shitty. <laughs> and then anthrax comes out and they play a bad set because they were equally hammered. So then Pantera comes out and absolutely destroys anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah. Cause they're so used to it playing like and, that. Yeah. And what I remember most was that in the in whatever national magazine just happened to cover that that show, and 
and they were uh, they were like there must have been the line was there must have been some shenanigans because none of these guys could play tonight. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and awesome. I just remember reading that and I was like, yeah, there were some shenanigans, all right. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Good stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, Chris. Thanks so much for coming on and talking with us tonight. It's, uh, sure. it's been great having you on the show. We're going to have uh, links up in today's show notes with with uh, links over to the Classic Metal Show. We'll put up uh, your, your Twitter account. What else? Facebook? Facebook, whatever. Yeah. The, the the website, all that stuff. Cool. It's oh, all yeah, good. And it's- we'll, have, we'll have links up to Chris's book, which I really – we're going to link the uh, Call Me Chris book, but I, I really recommend all, all his books. And there's another one coming soon, right? Is that there right? is, and that one's going to be a that's going to be a fun debaucherous book. I'm I'm going to shed my um, my label as a uh, self help guy, and it's literally I, I spent three years in Korea and okay. a bit of time in Arizona, just drinking and partying. It, it, it's a sex, drugs, and rock and roll book. Really. All right, cool. Well, you know, I will be reading it. Definitely. You know, it's, it's definitely different, <laughs> but it's, awesome. but it's fun. And when can we expect that? Uh, probably early next year. Cause okay. I'm slowly working through it, but no, dude, I really appreciate the time. And you know, if I got a message to you, all of your fans, it's, you know, everybody, please stop, you know, being pissed that we fix things. You right. know? Yeah. Because, uh, and I say that to my fans as well. It's not like it's it's not like I'm saying it here and then I'm spurring our guys on. You know, it's the, the, those days are done. You know, we're on to bigger and better things. We did do so. You know, we did the podcasting summit together, and and you know that was a nice step. And you came on the show, which was a nice. Step. I don't think we have to. I don't think me and you have to fight anymore or me and John. And therefore I don't think our fans have to be at war with your fans and vice versa. So let it go. Absolutely. I was glad John spoke to you and it was funny. You know, John was the guy too at M3. Uh, come to think of it. He was the guy who was like, Hey, that's Neely. Like he, I, I wouldn't probably have not known what Neely looked like, but um, sure. yeah, John somehow knew. And uh, he, he made that uh, connection and I was very happy that he, spoke with you because honestly for, for until he did that, there was always kind of this weirdness where I didn't want to misrepresent him in anything sure. that, that I said, you know, uh, to, to you or just publicly about, about classic metal show. And I know there are probably some people disappointed that he actually went on the show. Cause I, I, I think I shared a, there was an Instagram post or something not oh, too yeah. long ago where somebody was like, I can't believe you are friends with classic metal show now. Well, at least John has, isn't. And <laughs> so. he has some integrity. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what it was like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's all good now. So yeah. everybody can stop being mad and, you know, maybe we'll find a new war so that you guys can be happy with yeah. us again. What's, does dirt talk? What's going on with that? Are you still at war with those uh, guys? N- not really. I, I mean, they went away, and and the Rev is now the Moose, and he has some some underground underground metal thing that it, whatever. Yeah. You know, not, it, I, I'm I'm just not at that. I'm not at that place anymore. I don't have the only war I tend to seem to be accused of is Eddie Eddie Trunk, and that's. You know, I don't. I don't consider it a war. Right. I just didn't. Right. I didn't like him trying to steal our news. So I. The you know, said news it. right now. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I. I just. I just thought that was a bitch move, and and I said it to him, right. and you know, and now whatever he. I, I guess he made nice with Neely too. So you know, I guess there's no wars going on. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Chris, great talking with you, and. Again, let's do this again. I think we were talking about getting all four of us on on the classic metal show sometime. So maybe yeah. in a few months or yeah, sooner whenever, we can do that. Whenever, whenever you guys can arrange on your side, you know when we're on. So yeah. by all means, we can we can do it. Which reminds me, guys, classic metal show live every Saturday night, nine p.m. to three a.m. East Coast time, and you can it streams where that streams on Spreaker, uh, right? But it's also. On, it's on Spreaker or CMSRadio.net or UncontrolledNoise.com. Those are the three places that it, it can be heard. But the only recommendation I'd make is uh, make sure the kids are in bed first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> All right, Chris, take care, and uh, let's uh, talk again soon. Sounds good, man. Thanks for the time.
right there, a little Iomi, Tony Iomi, that is, with Glenn Hughes, a song that Chris uh, references in his book. You know, he does this real cool thing in the book where at the, he does it in his first book too, um, where at the beginning of each chapter, he quotes some lyrics that um, from a song that kind of like lead you into his, his writing about um, whatever topic that chapter is, is about. And that is, is one that is uh, about halfway through call me Chris, the book, call me Chris, Chris, he references that song right there. I owe me use face your fear. And it's, it's very cool. Again, each chapter, he does that with, with different songs. And then in the back of the book, he has uh, links to, to Spotify, where you can listen to all the music. Where, uh, you know, I bought the hard copies of the book, but I guess if you were reading them digitally, you could probably just click right on the, uh, the link if you were reading them on your iPad or iPhone or something, and it would open up your Spotify. So good stuff and good, good read. Call Me Chris by Chris Aiken. Again, it's linked through the show notes on TalkingMetal.com for this episode. And uh, yeah, support the music we play. Go buy that Pantera song, Mouth for War. Go buy the CD, I only use, although I think it's out of print, actually. It's not on Spotify. It's not on iTunes. Um, they uh, have it used on Amazon, but even the used copies are kind of expensive. Some of them going for like 30, over 30 bucks. So yeah, um, maybe you won't be able to go buy that. I don't know. I don't know. seems like it's currently out of print. Great record. It's called Fused by Iomi and Glenn Hughes on the vocals with that one. I think, I'm trying to think, I, I, I th- can't remember. He's done numerous things with, uh, with Hughes. I'm trying to remember if that's the one they went back and re-recorded the drum tracks because Dave Holland originally played on them. I'd, I'd need to check that. But uh, anyways, Iomi and Hughes always make a great combination. And uh, again, that is a great record, Fused by Tony Iomi and of course Glenn Hughes. Looking forward to new music from Glenn, hopefully coming soon. Black Country Communion, I believe just wrapping up recording. That's, of course, Glenn Hughes, Jason Bonham, son of the great John Bonham, and Joe Bonamassa, just an amazing player. Uh, you know, Joe, I have some of Joe's recordings on on mp3 and i I do like a a few of them a couple of them i really like some of the the slower stuff actually however when you see joe play live which my wife and i had the opportunity to see him play live uh probably about two years ago he will just blow you away such a deep rich rock blues player highly recommended you know like i said the his his recordings never quite capture his greatness but he is amazing joe bonamassa and again the three of those guys in the studio or i believe have already possibly left the studio uh and we have a new record from them under their uh their name black country communion guys thanks for joining me on this episode of talking metal to take us out let's uh Let's do Soul Sacrifice by Power Trip. <laughs> 